All right. Uh, welcome back. Let's continue with our um, the same topic of overcoming. The next chapter has to do with more details about the weapons of our warfare. So we know that God has given us weapons, spiritual weapons, against Satan. Uh, let's read about it in Second Corinthians chapter ten, verses three to five. Uh, and I'll request Akhil to please read that passage. It talks about spiritual weapons. Second Corinthians 10. Uh, Second Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Okay, so we understand here that for the attacks of Satan against us, God has given us spiritual weapons. We cannot use natural weapons to deal with Satan. And so God gives us spiritual weapons. Now our job is to identify what are these spiritual weapons and then learn to use that weapon. Isn't it? That's what we do even in the natural. If there is danger, then uh, let's take for example soldiers. They would need to know what weapons are available to protect themselves. And then those weapons are given to them they undergo training. They learn. Okay, how do I learn to, to attack the enemy? How do I learn to shoot with this, maybe a gun that is given to them? So there's a training that they undergo to use the weapon. So the same thing applies for us. We just saw that there are spiritual weapons that God has given us against Satan. Because earthly weapons will not work. All our other tricks of the trade will not work against Satan. So we have to use the right weapons, we have to use the spiritual weapons. And what did we read in this passage? That those thoughts for the pulling down of strongholds, so the destroying of Satan's attacks is possible by spiritual weapons. That also tells us, one is that spiritual weapons are there. Second is, spiritual weapons are effective. They do the work. If we are thinking about destroying the enemy's game plan, then when I use a spiritual weapon, it is effective, it will tear down, it will destroy. So then I need to learn how do I use it, you know, which one do I use uh, and uh, really see victory in that particular situation. So spiritual weapons must be used against Satan to enforce our victory. Weapons are both for defense as well as to attack. If we want to attack the devil also, we can using these spiritual weapons. So let's consider what are those weapons. Uh, firstly, we will talk about the armor. We've done that quite well in the earlier section. The armor of God which protects us, provides us with uh, defense as well as, you know, we can use the sword to attack or the shield of faith can also be a source to attack the devil. So firstly, put on the armor. Now think about a believer who does not have the armor. Now we've explained, so I'm not going to go into every part of it, like helmet, belt of truth, um, and uh, you know, breastplate of righteousness, gospel, the shoes of the gospel, faith, and so on. Now think about a believer who does not have the armor. What would you th what would you say if you notice a believer with no armor? Huh? Even before fighting, you have to weaken the position. Even before you engage, even if before you defend, you are already very weak if you are not having the armor. Okay, so if you are not wearing the armor, uh, even if you are not engaging in war, you are weak. Before, before uh, you oppose the enemy, you are already weak. Right. So if you don't have an armor, now do we think that we can be without the armor? When should we put on the armor? Okay, this is a better question. When should we put on the armor? All times. Why all times? Put it when the when you're going for war. 
Keep it at home. Hang it. Hang it at home. <laughs> we are always at war. Okay. Um, this is Brother Kofi. Okay. You said we are always at war. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, Shani. Oh, no, I was just answering the question. Oh, you were um, answering the question? Yeah, the, we need the armor. What is uh, your uh, answer? Um, well, my answer is always, and also you asked a question about why, what happens to the believer who doesn't have armor, who doesn't have armor, they will constantly um, be attacked. Yeah, so those who don't have the armor will obviously be attacked. And um, so even Shani is saying always, uh, Sister Lucy is saying always, but my question, my second question is, why always? Because you're not under attack. So why you want to carry heavy armor? You know, scriptures say, right? Like, Goliath's armor is so heavy, so many kgs. Why you want to put on armor? It's quite tiring. Hmm? Good. Very good. See, if we are soldiers, and if we are, um, we know that there is an enemy. The smart soldier is always ready. Okay? That's how it works. And that is the reason at all times we have to put on the armor. We can't wait. Obviously, Satan won't tell, right? Okay, can I take an appointment? I will come tomorrow. At this time, I will attack you with this weapon. That would be quite... No enemy does that. They watch for a time when we are off guard. That is the best time for the enemy. Whenever he finds that we are taking it easy, we are taking it light, you know, uh, and uh, we are not even thinking about standing or putting on the armor, nothing. Then he feels like, oh, wow, now I can get them because they are not alert. So that alertness is needed from a soldier at all times. Same thing is applicable to us as believers. Picture it as soldiers. That's why Paul said, put on the armor. We are in warfare. And no good soldier will take a rest or a nap carelessly. Right? First of all, we are not supposed to. <laughs> and so always be on guard. Any time, any moment, Satan can come to uh, attack us. So that is the way. Put on the armor always. Uh, Shani, I see your hand up, but I'm assuming you were probably trying to answer the earlier question. Yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so there are other answers here in the chat section. Sister Lucy says, Satan, walking like a roaring lion to attack. Shekhar says, we are at war zone. Okay, Deepu, we are in the battlefield. Oh, nice. So everyone's thinking like a soldier. <laughs> All of us are soldiers over here. Great. So that's true. We've got to think like a soldier and be ready at any moment. Okay. So put on the armor is applicable all the time. All the time. So every part of the... What, what would we do to protect the head? Helmet. With the helmet. Okay. Want to protect your heart? What should you put? Breastplate of righteousness. Okay, so the the um, the knowledge that I am the righteousness of God. Satan will come and keep accusing. No, God doesn't like you. He has not forgiven you. His forgiveness is not complete. You are still guilty. When we entertain these things, what happens? My heart is at risk. You are exposing your heart. There's no breastplate. He can quickly get you. Right? There are dangers of playing with the devil. So we can't afford that. If we are a smart soldier, we cannot afford that. We've got to put on the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, know the truth of God's word. Think about a believer who doesn't know the truth of God's word. You don't know God's word. I'm a believer. I could say, I'm a believer. 10 years I'm a believer. But then how much of the word do we know? How much of the word are we applying? If we are not doing that, then... We're exposing ourselves to attack. Got it? So these are the things that we must be aware of. Then sharing the gospel, having faith. That's a believer who's ready. So put on at all times means I have to work on all these things. Maybe I'm not strong in my identity in Christ. Maybe my faith is not strong enough. Maybe I my prayer life is weak. Maybe I'm not able to fast. 
work on it, work on everything. And then what happens? I'm putting myself in a position where I'm strong. Satan will come. He will attack. There's no doubts about that. He's waiting. When can I come? When can I attack? But even if the enemy attacks, when we are um, dressed with the armor, we can overcome the enemy. Right? So at all times, have the spiritual armor on. Now, let's see which are the other weapons which we can use against the devil. Faith. So if there is a believer who's carrying faith, it's very difficult for Satan to get them. Very difficult. Shield of faith. Right? We said that. So Satan comes with a lie. And, uh, you know, he, he may say uh, something that, okay, um, this business will not work out or, uh, you know, your ministry will not work out. Immediately, we start to use our faith. We say, no. God has called me to this business. God has called me to this ministry. And then begin to quote scripture, right? You begin to speak the word of God. And you say, no, God makes me fruitful. Uh, the Lord anoints me. The anointing on my life breaks and destroys the yoke uh, of uh, the enemy over the lives of people that I minister to. So when I start speaking like this, I'm speaking my faith. And Satan can't stand it. Right? So faith is very important, very important in every phase of our lives. Um, it, it's especially when we are by ourselves. You know, sometimes we are in this kind of a setting and we feel like, oh, great. You know, every day I'm listening to the word. Every day I'm being filled with the word. But what about uh, seasons of our lives where we are by ourselves? We don't have this going on. But hopefully in those seasons we have the daily disciplines of spending time in the word, praying, fasting. So as an individual, when I'm doing that regularly, I'm still strong. I'm still walking by faith and the enemy cannot get me. Okay. So having faith in God, especially in difficult times, especially, you know, maybe when we are feeling like, oh, there's too much pressure. I'm all by myself. Faith is what will help us overcome in those moments. So use faith as a weapon against the devil next one is the word of god word of god we saw it's a sword take the sword keep saying no satan whatever he says just keep saying you know it is written it is written it is written uh, i remember a friend of mine she used to say if you start quoting scriptures like that no satan will get irritated he'll be like oh i go find someone else whenever i come to this person they start speaking the word and you know start quoting scriptures i'm so fed up of listening to all these scriptures I'll go find someone else. Okay, so uh, that's a habit which we need. Speak the word. Speak the word about different circumstances, situations. We see in the book of uh, Revelation, it, it, it talks about in Revelation 19, 15, the Lord Jesus and the sword is coming out of his mouth. So it's very helpful because it's teaching us how to use the sword. When we say sword of the spirit, we have a question. How to use the sword? Use it from your mouth. Because a sword is coming out of the mouth of Jesus. So it's not your usual way of using the sword. The sword has to be used from the mouth. Okay? In the case of the word of God. So speak the word. Speak the word. So we've got to become believers who are declaring the word in all situations and circumstances. I know it's not easy. Uh, at least for me, it was never easy because, you know, memorizing, saying the scripture. Sometimes we, at least me, I know I struggled. But get used to it little by little. You know, build that vocabulary from the scriptures. If it's helpful, make a list of uh, scriptures and keep it ready. Our church app, if any of you has... Uh, on to our church app, there is a section called as a toolkit. So when you go there, there are declarations, there are scriptures. Readily you can go, like let's say healing. If I go to that healing section, there'll be a lot of verses about healing. So if I'm traveling or I don't know what scriptures to say, if it's not in my head, I can use something else. These days you have an app, you have uh, you know sources, uh, like, you know, integrate it to your phone and all. So just use that. If it comes to that, just use it if you're not so good with your memory. Okay. But hopefully it will become a part of your 
memory as well so speak the word of god and it has to come out of the mouth now we also see in deuteronomy 30 verses 11 to 14 uh, speaking about the word of god we are told that the word is very near you it is in your heart and it is in your mouth so god has made his word available imagine if i ask you to do something which is difficult you know if i tell you uh, uh um, every uh, you know uh, you have to read this book i give you a reference name of one particular book and maybe the book is very expensive and the book is not available you have to go search on amazon and it's available in some other country and you have to buy it you have to source it, it it's very difficult or transport it to our country it may the instruction that i gave you is a difficult one because you cannot get it but what God is saying is, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart. How difficult is it to speak? It's accessible, right? Like accessible meaning, I can get it easily. And so use it. Speak the word of God. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, the access is not difficult at all. And especially for our generation, you can get different versions of the Bible on your phone. Isn't it? So, so much is possible today. Resources, ample resources. You can even go to APCW, the website. You know, I keep going back to it. There are sermons from 2004. So let's say you want to study a little bit about uh, believer's authority. There are, there are you know, different sermons that have been preached under this subject. So one can go and study all of those sermons, all the scriptures, all the, you know, like the explanations and all. Uh, and it's very helpful. Everything available on, in one place. So to make an excuse and say, oh, I, I can't use the word of God. It's not acceptable in today's world. You get it. You get everything that you want in the click of a button. Right? So we have to train ourselves. That's the whole point. So train ourselves to access material, good material, not just any material, and then meditate on it. The more you meditate on it, it starts to go inside, build faith, and it comes to our mouth, right? And you have access to the word, then you start to speak the word. So that is the way the word can be used as a weapon against the devil. Um, okay. Yes, I think there's a question. Yes, yes, Shani? Yeah, I have a question. You were saying something about... Um second notes about something about jesus the sword yeah something you were saying about that can you explain that and also can you explain what revelation 19 15 about we must speak a double-edged sword can you explain that and mm -hmm. but one last just one last question that i have is that what if somebody's sick and they can't speak because they're so sick is, mm -hmm. is them saying those scripture those those uh, those scriptures in their mind is that as effective as speaking it out if they are not able to mm -hmm yeah thank you thank you shani um so firstly about uh, revelation 19 and verse 15 that's what we quoted and it says now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So this is a, a portion that is describing the course of events that will take place. Um, and you know, we, we know that there will come a time when the Lord Jesus Himself will fight the armies of the nations. Okay, and um, uh, there are all those details about the Armageddon and the millennial rule and um, later on the judgment of Christ and all. So uh, it, it's at the point where um, we'll have the Armageddon. We find that the way Jesus fights that battle is through the word that he speaks. Okay? And we've noticed in this verse 15, um, Shani, that the way he attacks the nations is through his word. And that is explained in it's like pictorial language so it, it's um i mean i don't know how to put it but it's figurative speech where we are told that 
there is a sword coming out of his mouth and our understanding is the words that he speaks so through the words that he speaks he demonstrates his authority his power and he destroys those opposing nations so is that helpful about revelation yeah. 19 yeah that that explains i was kind of i didn't quite understand the double edged sword of the spirits but i think that okay. that explains it yes and the next question you asked is what if someone is not able to speak it okay yeah uh, now if someone's not able to speak it firstly i think god understands if someone's sick or someone has an issue where they cannot um their voice doesn't come forth and secondly i think in such a situation where there's a genuine reason why the person cannot speak the the thoughts right or the or the um, convictions that we carry as thoughts they matter even if we don't speak it if we think it i believe it's powerful but i cannot give you a scripture and verse for that okay thank you yeah that I, i'm yeah. sorry what did you say i said it's my perspective okay so so even though you can't speak it mm -hmm. having it in your mind you know saying in your thoughts is just does affect is just as effective yes i i believe okay. so okay great thank you i i remember uh, there was one incident where um, you know someone suddenly had a heart attack and uh, that person they they were conscious but not you know like uh, strong enough to think speak they could see everything that is going on around them and uh, they spoke about a prayer that they prayed in those moments like imagine the person cannot speak but the person has faith in their hearts and then they you know prayed the prayer and they uh, they spoke the word from their hearts and uh, how the lord rescued them from that situation and they were able to overcome it uh, so god definitely is much more righteous than us he understands in those moments when we are not able to speak but we have those same thoughts in our minds and we are declaring the word i believe it's powerful it it is powerful like what we speak okay. sure so let's move on from there so the word we speak is a weapon and um, the believer needs to carry the word with him if if yeah sure go ahead out of context because you just mentioned uh -huh. a small example yeah. there were many years back you know when i was fast asleep and uh, for some reason i'm disturbed and i just wake up midnight and uh, it was a uh, uh, thing like you know there's a gripping on my mouth you know i couldn't say just jesus it was just like really like struggling yes and it, in in a sleep and then i get up and it yes. takes some time and then it's like release and then you say jesus and just feel a little okay. sigh of relief so what was that type of thing i know okay. it's a lot of context but no no it's not the, out of context um i mean i would i i uh, feel like that would be a demonic oppression so um and by the actions of that spirit you we could say it it's something like a mute spirit trying to hush us from not speaking the word of god so in such circumstances we have to take authority and you know you rebuke the spirit um you you cast it you resist it you have to speak to the spirit and you have to command it i command you to leave in the name of jesus you know i'm set free so you could begin to declare those kind of strict the scriptures but i i believe that's what it it is it's not you but it's an external oppression sure ah uh, yes yes a uh, warren yes is there just to just to carry on from what brother was saying uh, you know there were times when not it doesn't happen now but in the past when you know a uh, you wake up it's uh, mean what they class it as a uh, sleep paralysis mm -hmm. but you know it was more i think uh, what you are saying it was uh, more like a, a spiritual attack because yes. you know you wake up and you want to say something and you, like even you want to you know praise god or say the scripture and you actually can't words don't come out yes uh, but, but uh, i mean of, of course i've learned one thing that you know the more you get into the word the more you get into walk in faith 
mm. the, the, these attacks sort of diminish you know, you'll find them less and less as you go you get stronger in your faith yes yes yeah that that's uh, true warren so we could have had experiences where uh, you know in our sleep uh, or when we're just trying to wake up or, uh, similar to what uh, akhil shared we're feeling oppressed we're not able to speak the word um, and it is demonic and we have to learn to overcome that so yeah and you see satan also inter intercepts the way um, we, we've been saying that the mind is a battlefield, isn't it? The mind is important for God. The mind is also important for Satan. So when God spoke to Abraham, God didn't give him any, um, any proof like in the sense of an object and say, okay, you keep this token. Okay, I, my promise is true. I'll come back to you and you'll have what I told you. There's, there was no such token that he gave him. But in the mind of Abraham, we saw how you know, Abraham believed God. And then Abraham, in his imaginations, he, he went there where God was telling him. Okay? So then when we think about faith, when we think about um, trusting God, believing God, journeying with God, our thoughts, our imagination, the same things, our thoughts, imaginations, the right reasoning, and that becoming set in our mind is very important. Okay? So our mind is important for God. Our mind is also important for Satan because that's where he can win the battle. And so he will bring temptation and deception, all that in our minds. So the point that, uh, what is the point that I'm trying to make? I forgot. Yeah, we were talking about, oh yeah, Warren, intercepting. So then what happens is, uh, since Satan can, can put those evil thoughts, right? we see that even God can. That's where we get dreams, visions, where God puts his thoughts into our minds. So when we recognize that this is from God, we accept it. And then we can pray it through, we can uh, declare it, we can write it down. But when Satan is intercepting, that's when we get like nightmares, we get uh, dreams uh, or, or suggestions in the mind, like what we are talking about. We, we feel like, oh, there's somebody stopping us, somebody's doing this, doing that. So it is possible that Satan does that. He can also bring in those thoughts. But it's up to us what we choose to keep, what we choose to reject. We have to be very active in that. So in the morning, if you wake up and you feel like, see, uh, and there are the scriptures also say that dreams come because of preoccupation. Sometimes we are so, we're thinking about exams, all the dreams are about exams, how the bell is ringing and how the, you know, the uh, examiner is pulling away the paper because you're thinking about the activity. So it's not necessarily God or Satan. So when we wake up in the morning, we have to think like, okay, where is it from? If it is from God, then we start to pray it through. If it is just a dream like that, let it go. But if it is from Satan, even a prayer like, you can pray this prayer. You can say, um, whatever I saw, I cancel it in the name of Jesus. You can pray that prayer. I cancel. Satan, whatever you are showing me, I'm canceling it in the name of Jesus. It will not happen in my life. It will not happen in the life of my loved one. You can pray a prayer like that and just destroy the suggestions of the enemy. Okay? So that also is very helpful. So use your weapon. And you just destroy the plan which Satan is putting in our minds. So just a little bit about sleep and dream and things like that. Okay, let's move on. Um, so we've spoken about the word of God, speaking the word of God in all situations. Now there's another weapon which we can use. And that is the blood of Jesus. This, the devil does not like the reference to the blood of Jesus because the blood of Jesus speaks of Satan's defeat. So every time we say the blood of Jesus, Satan gets very angry. He doesn't like it at all. And that's a weapon which we can use against the devil, the blood of Jesus. Let's read one scripture, Revelation 12 verse 11. 
Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. I think Sagar will read it for us. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Okay, how does it begin? And they overcame uh, by the blood of the Lamb. So the blood of the Lamb. Lamb is referring to Jesus. So the blood of Jesus. We notice that there is overcoming power in the blood of Jesus. And that is what we want to use as a weapon. The blood of Jesus to overcome the devil. So what are all the works that the blood of Jesus has done for us and continues to do for us? There's a whole list here. I'll quickly read through it. Okay, but we can always take time, go back and meditate. In fact, we can sit with this for hours and um, praise God for the work that the blood of Jesus has done for us. So scriptures teach us that the blood of Jesus cleanses us. There's no other blood that has the power to wash away our sins. Right Before um, Jesus came and he died, what was going on? There were many temple practices. And uh, many animals used to be sacrificed for the sake of the blood. They wanted the blood to make an offering. Can you imagine, for years and years, the shedding of blood kept happening. But none, no blood could wash away the sin of mankind. But the Bible teaches us that when the Lord Jesus shed his blood, that is the only blood right, which has the capacity to wash away our sin. So that is the power of the blood of Jesus. Now, when we take this truth before Satan, we say, I am washed by the blood of Jesus. He doesn't like it because he wants us to be guilty. He wants us to carry the burden of shame. But we are saying, look, the blood of Jesus set me free. I am no longer um, uh, guilty. Right? I am set free by the blood of Jesus. So the cleansing work of sin is done by the blood of Jesus. And that's very powerful, very, very powerful. So the blood of Jesus has cleansed us. The blood of Jesus justifies us. It has reconciled us to God. It brought us near to God. That's what scripture says. How did we come close to God? We could not. If you go back to the temple practices, only the high priest could go into that holy of holies once a year. Can you imagine? If you and I want to go in, no chance. We cannot. But today, every believer you know, uh, can have, we are saying, intimacy with God. How to have intimacy with God? The blood of Jesus. It brought us near to God. So that is the work which the blood of Jesus has done for us. It brought us near to God. It gave us boldness to enter the holiest. So earlier, if people entered the holiest without the blood, they would die. Because blood is needed. On the Ark of the Covenant, the scriptures tell us the blood used to be poured. That's when the presence of the Lord will come and meet with the high priest. Today, we have the blood of Jesus because of which we can enter into the presence of God. We don't have to be afraid. right? Every single believer, what a privilege that we can come near to God through the blood of Jesus. And so this is the work that the blood has done. So uh, earlier I mentioned to us that when we say use the weapon of the blood, how, how to use the weapon of the blood of Jesus? Word we know, speak the word. Believe the word, speak the word. How to use the weapon of the blood of Jesus? You plead the blood of Jesus on yourself. Okay, plead the blood. And by faith, you cover yourself with the blood. Okay, that's true. Yeah. Fine. So we need to have faith in what the blood has done and speak of that. So having understanding of what the blood has done. Now, sometimes what we could do as believers is we can just say uh, like, 
I don't know if you've heard it, but I've heard it. Sometimes when there's like a demon manifestation or something like that, people just say, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. Just repetition of that thing, of, of that weapon. You see, yeah, we are speaking of the power of the blood of Jesus, which is good. But the effective way is if we know what the blood has done for us. Imagine we are just saying blood of Jesus and we have no idea what the blood has done for us. Whenever there is ignorance, it's, it's not helpful against Satan. But when we know what the blood has done for us, then we become, um, you know, it's lethal. Satan cannot take it because he knows that we have understanding of what the blood stands for. So that is what we need. And that's why I'm saying, though I will read through everything, please take time, meditate in it. Try to understand what does it mean the blood has cleansed me, the blood has brought me near, the blood uh, has reconciled me to God, the blood gives me boldness to enter the holiest. Understanding. Understand what the blood has done for us. Then it is effective against the devil. Okay? All right. So what else has the blood done for us? The blood is the blood of the new covenant. We need blood to seal the covenant, isn't it? And in this case, the new covenant, Jesus shed his own blood and he sealed it for us. So this is the blood of the new covenant. I have a new covenant with God and it was sealed by Jesus himself who shed his blood. So that is the understanding of the blood of the new covenant, sanctified by the blood redeemed by the blood, purchased by the blood, uh, cleansed in our conscience from dead works by the blood, redeemed from a vain way of living by the blood, overcoming the enemy by the blood. Jesus has become the Passover lamb who shed his blood and protects. He protects us. The way the Passover lamb in Exodus protected the people. You remember? They took the blood and they uh, painted it on their doorposts. Same way today, blood of Jesus is my protection. So some of you said, cover yourself with the blood of the lamb. So that is how we do it. We have faith in the protection that comes from the blood of Jesus. Then the blood of Jesus atones uh, for our sins. The blood of Jesus was sprinkled on the mercy seat. Okay, uh, and you know we understand that that whole thing of uh, the blood being sprinkled on the mercy seat and the presence of God coming near us. Then the blood of Jesus uh, is what establishes the eternal covenant. The blood bears witness on the earth, and uh, it is the shedding of the blood that gives us white robes. We read that in Revelation and later on. We are going to see all the believers come before God. And scriptures talk about people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue wearing white robes. So white robes refers to righteousness. How can the people be made righteous except by the washing of the blood of Jesus? So everyone is accepted. Everyone is made righteous through the blood of Jesus. So this is the work of the blood of Jesus. And uh, one needs to understand what the blood has done for us. When we understand it, it becomes a weapon. Okay? So uh, even in the case of deliverance, we'll go to it later when we are casting out demons, right? We can speak all these things. We can begin to talk. The blood has cleansed us. The blood has set us free from guilt and shame. You know, the blood has drawn us near to God. Um, uh, we overcome you by the blood of Jesus. So when you're speaking like this, you're weakening the hold of the enemy moment by moment. And we can expect those demons to actually leave. Okay? So speak what the blood has done instead of uh, just a repetition of, let's say, the blood of Jesus or any other term like that. All right. So I, I'm thinking maybe we will stop at this so that you can take some time to think through about the blood of Jesus. The next one is also very powerful, the name of Jesus. And we will deal with it in the next class. We need some time to uh, really understand that. So I'm just going to stop here. But um, if there are any, any questions or anything to discuss, let's take it up. Uh, yeah, it bears witness. 
Yes. There are three that bear witness on earth the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. The spirit, the water, water and, and the, the blood. blood. Yeah. Yeah, it bears witness. Okay, let me just uh, plainly say that I don't think I have an accurate answer for that. So, uh, would need to look that up. Yeah, sorry, Akil. I don't think. Yes, any anything else? Okay. Um, yes, uh, Shani? Yeah, it says, um, I know it says in the Bible, by his stripes we are healed. Is that one example about the blood of, of how the, because I'm looking on the list here, mm -hmm. 19. Is that is that one reference in terms of how the blood of Jesus in, in regards to healing? Okay. Um, it's a reference that we can uh, speak of with regard to healing, it does not really, I, I, I don't think it's like a direct reference for the blood. OK. OK. Yes, yes, Warren. Uh, sorry, Warren, I wasn't sure if you had intended to unmute, so that's why I, I kind of muted you back. Please go oh, ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sister. No, no with regards to that, uh, you know, by stripes I'm healed or by stripes we are healed. Uh, when we were starting out our journey as believers many, many years ago, uh, my brother and I, you know, we didn't have we didn't have much knowledge about uh, the scripture. We didn't and we only knew certain verses that uh, we would apply. And yes. uh, this is one of the verses we would apply for every situation. Okay. Because we didn't know anything else. And to be honest, it's one of those things, especially my brother used to do it all the time. No matter what the situation was, by your stripes I'm healed, by your stripes I'm healed. And to be honest, you know, it, it, God came every time he came uh, and, and delivered us from that situation. So, but, but I agree with you because it was, you know, there are people who are uh, ignorant, who will not, you know, want to learn more. Uh, yeah. that, that that's when it is like you know it's it, it sort of loses its power but uh, for us because we were just starting our journey we had that faith in that word the yeah. word of god no matter no matter whether if it was relevant to the situation or no i think that that was important that we had the faith mm. no yes true true so i mean god is so good isn't it even if we uh, only use that one scripture when we are starting out it works every time but as you rightly stated, when we are journeying with the Lord, He does expect us to grow and become stronger. Uh, I always like to go back to the John 15 uh, example where He's the true vine, we are the branches, and God is expecting growth. He's expecting fruitfulness. He's expecting lasting fruit. So eventually it has to come, and that's God's expectation. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for those thoughts. And um, we can pray and close off for today. Uh, the next class, yeah, next class is next Tuesday. So we, we will have the class. So let's uh, pray then. And I want to request somebody from the online batch to please lead in prayer. Father, Je sorry, okay. go ahead, go ahead, brother. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for for your words. Thank you for your instructions. Thank you, Lord, for all what we've been able to learn today. We give you all the praise and all the glory. We even ask the Lord that even as we go and continue with our next sessions, Lord, we ask and commit our ways, commit our thoughts, and commit our, our minds, Lord, into your hands. We ask the Lord that you grant us understanding and um, wisdom. We ask all this in the name of your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nadel. God bless. And thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a great week ahead. Bye for now.